بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله في هف توفيق تو ستارت our second subject for this term and that is Islamic plan for life this is based on the book with the same name Islamic plan for life which is part of a series of five books that we have been working on for several years maybe you have already watched uh, our online book launch for this book recently and if not it is available where I have explained uh, the idea behind compiling these five books briefly we wanted to have everything that a person needs to know about Islam and the school of Ahlul Bayt when they go for universities, when they go for work, when they get married, anything that they need to know in one package. So we came up with the idea of five books and two of them are possible to be welcomed and accepted by Muslims across the schools of Islam. Sunni, Shia, they can relate to it three of them are for the Shia of course everyone is welcome to a study and I think they will enjoy reading it but it would not represent every school of Islam those three which are representing the Shia in particular are about Ahkam and Fiqh about history of the Shia from beginning up to today the lives of Imams and the Shia in the time of Ghaiba and also a book on Imam and these three are uh, not yet published we are working on them inshallah uh, one by one they come but those two volumes which are uh, going to be welcomed by Shia and non-Shia are Islamic belief system and Islamic plan for life Islamic belief system covers Aqaid except Imama because for Imama we have another book and we wanted this to be general and Islamic plan for life which is this book that we are studying now Islamic belief system Alhamdulillah we had it in Hujjat Academy here and even before it was published we had a term in Stanmore on that, we had in Birmingham, we had in Toronto, we had in Hamburg, we had in Tanzania, in many places, in Qom. Islamic Plan for Life, before it was published, we had a course on it, on uh, Islamic Plan for Life in Stanmore, but just based on the outlines, on the headings, not the actual book, because we uh, take time till we publish the book we first come up with the t outlines and then we teach the draft of the content and then when we are satisfied then we print it so this is the very first time that after publication of Islamic plan for life uh, we are teaching this in uh, London and in the UK I taught uh, just one two units in Qom and uh, Rasalat course last year but this is the very first time I'm teaching actually from the beginning of the book so I hope inshallah this would be useful and inshallah would be remaining also for other people to use uh, the book is alhamdulillah uh, available uh, because it is printed in the United States so we are in the process of receiving it and inshallah the brothers and sisters in Hujjat Academy uh, will tell you how to get your copy inshallah now let's first go quickly through the uh, structure of the book 
in order to appreciate the book it's always good to browse the book from the beginning to the end read the introduction read carefully table of contents any book that you get before you uh, start you have to do these things if there are recommendations about it read it if there is introduction forward preface read it first table of contents browse it when you have an idea of the book in its entirety then uh, start from the first chapter so what about Islamic plan for life this book is a follow-up for Islamic belief system of course it doesn't rely on that in the sense that if you don't understand that you don't understand this but logically our plan for life cannot be independent from our understanding of our aqaid it doesn't make sense our aqaid actually is to help us understand what is felicity what is happiness what is saada and how to achieve it so islamic belief system as you remember has seven units and unit seven was on felicity or happiness we said allah has provided us with guidance to reach fel felicity for individuals for society in this world and the hereafter now how we achieve that happiness or felicity or saada islamic plan for life is an answer for that islam says and actually this is common in all abrahamic faith but we are studying islam and we have here lots of you know details uh, when it comes to islam about all these aspects we have to follow the path to happiness partly through morality through ethics through virtues through qualities of the soul so a great part of it actually depends on the heart purification of the heart monitoring your heart observing what is happening in your heart understanding what gives you motivation it's very important if you want to analyze any person you must see why they do things it's not just enough to look at what they do yes what they do is important and inshallah we'll talk about it later but even if someone does the best things uh, still it's not enough because why he do these things that's the most important question is he doing to show off or is he doing this sincerely so it's all a matter of what is in the heart and this is why Allah can only judge we are not able to judge Allah can judge whether this person is sincere or not whether this person is pious or not yes maybe if we have lived with someone for long time and especially if our opinion is shared by many people then we can say this person is a pious person but not just by seeing you know someone doing something no living with someone over a long period of time and also having the same understanding shared by many other people then you may say he is a pious person and uh, still it's better if you leave the decisive judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to say someone is a bad person sometimes you don't know it's not easy yes maybe sometimes the person is so vicious <laughs> and we and many many people know that he's a vicious person then maybe we can say but uh, still you have to be very careful 
I'm not saying you can never judge, but I'm saying it's very, very difficult. Because Allah knows what is happening in the heart of people. Allah knows what excuses they may have. Allah knows what type of upbringing they, had, they have had. He would never expect from two people the same thing. Because you cannot find two people exactly in the same condition. Even if there are twins, they are not exactly in the same condition. Let alone, for example, siblings of the same family, family who are brought up in different times. Even if they are brought up in the same time, born the same time, it doesn't mean that their context is totally the same. Their talents are the same. Their uh, skills, you know, have to be the same. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who knows what is happening in the heart, what circumstances they have gone through, what background they have had, what capital they were given at the beginning, what challenges they went through. So, we cannot judge. But, in a general way, we can say, that heart of people and I don't mean the physical heart I mean the soul heart of people is where the great part of the journey towards happiness towards nearness to Allah towards perfection take place heart then another part is your actions what you are doing with your organs with your hands with your feet with your eyes with your mouth with your ears in this book we start with two units on ethics individual or personal ethics and social or interpersonal ethics and we have particularly chosen some topics which we think are very relevant today. There are topics that are relevant all the time. There are topics which are more needed at particular time. We thought these are the list of uh, virtues that we need very much today. So inshallah, in the first two units, we will study these personal and social uh, virtues and values after that we go to unit 3 which is about individual behavioral conducts it's about actions about behavior something that we have to do or not to do as individual and then as a community as a society as a member of community or society what should I do with respect to others and we have identified some topics which are very important and interesting then we talk about family a great part of Islamic lifestyle is related to family as a child as a husband and wife as a parent or grandparent family is always very much in the center of Islamic lifestyle your relation with your father with your mother with your I don't know uncles aunts cousins Salaya Rahim in-laws all are important and in particular we talk about marriage and divorce as two things that in family life are to be discussed then we talk about society Islamic society Islamic way of securing welfare order and justice in social life how Islam introduces its judiciary system to observe justice how Islam introduces its welfare system to ensure that there is welfare how Islam introduces its political system to make sure that there is 
justice, there is order, especially order in the society, no chaos, no anarchy. And then we talk about Islamic culture and civilization. What is the difference between Islamic culture and culture of Muslims? As you know, Islam is very much open to people having their own cultures. Islam didn't impose a kind of fixed culture on Muslims. Islam introduces some principles, some values, some attitudes, but then leaves it to people. People in Latin America, people in North America, people in Europe, in Africa, in Middle East, in Asia, Eastern Asia, South Asia, I don't know, in Australia, in New Zealand, they can have their own color of Islam. They can have their own culture. They can bring the best of their heritage, the best of their culture, the best of their civilization, arts, skills, talents to Islam. No restriction. But they just need to make sure that they all remain compatible with Islamic values. We don't, for example, encourage polytheism or shirk. We don't encourage, for example, a slavery of man by man. We don't encourage racism or apartheid. Or we don't encourage, for example, liberty in the sense of you don't feel responsible for your behavior and you think you can do whatever you like or enjoy. We cannot accept class system in the same that some people forever are to be subordinate to others. So there are a few things that you have to observe, but then there can be lots of colors of Islam. Islam is universal. Islam is without any specific color. And this is why it can welcome all the colors, but they just remain respectful to other colors. If any color wants to impose itself on others and restrict others, then they are not part of the universal Islam. So these are things that inshallah, hopefully we are going to discuss in this book with the expanded inshallah discussions that we are going to have in the class. So to begin putting our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his name, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We start with the first unit. The first unit is about self-building. Some of you who are familiar with uh, our previous courses and books, you know that uh, we have had uh, courses, alhamdulillah, on self-knowledge and a book is there on self-knowledge where I have explained the significance of ma'rifatun nafs, knowing yourself. And inshallah today I'm going to quote some hadith from that book. Also we had courses on self-building advanced which were later published as essays in Message of Thaqalain and then later they were uh, developed further and published as self-development. So we already have, alhamdulillah, two books, self-knowledge and self-development. For those who are more interested in these subjects, they can refer to those books. There are lectures available on these topics. So as much as you have time, you are more than welcome to familiarize yourself with this topic and inshallah reflect on them because this is what you need for yourself before you help other people. And for sure also you need it for others, for your family, for you know children, students, whatever. But I'm saying before anything else, we need it for ourselves. So what we have in this unit now is just a summary because you can imagine this book covers great and vast area 
and it's already more than 200 pages so we cannot discuss every topic in 30 40 pages so the first part of unit one is about self-building self-building if you want to put it in a kind of order you can say in Islam everything that we do in order to make ourselves better in order to make ourselves what we like and what we can be proud of in dunya and akhirah is called self-building but how does this start and what is the breakdown of this process many years ago when i was asked to give a lecture in one of the rounds of catholic shia dialogue on a spiritual direction alhamdulillah this idea came to my mind and later i put it in the book self-development when i gave lectures and then in the book that maybe we can say the very first step is awareness to become awake there is this famous hadith that we have also in the book that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said anna sunniyamun hatta idha ma tuntabahu people are asleep even those who are physically awake they are asleep when they die they become alert ghafla heedlessness is a big problem actually our problems most important problems are two forgetfulness nesyan and ghafla these two are two problems we may not know many things and we have to learn but this is not our main problem our main problem are those things that we know but we either forget or become heedless therefore we need always reminder why the Quran is called dhikr in huwa illa dhikrun lil alameen why rasulullah is dhikr why ahlul bayt are ahlul dhikr why so much emphasis on dhikr laqad yassarna al quran lil dhikr fa hal min muddakir in huwa illa dhikra lil alameen why because forgetfulness and heedlessness can only be stopped or if they have already come to be treated by remembrance we need to become alert we need to become conscious we need to become awake so the very first step is what mystics call yaqza yaqza means to be awake in farsi we say bidar we have to be awake we have to be alert but then after that what should you know okay now I am awake what should I know you should know yourself so nafs to know yourself not in the sense that you know your name you know your date of birth place of birth parents I don't know mm, passport number no it's much more than that these are the things that people also can easily know about me and you know maybe with the access to a database I can know this about millions of people no this is not self-knowledge self-knowledge is much more than that self-knowledge means that you know what a great gift Allah has given us in the form of human spirit our body is already great our body is a massive factory plus many many other things 
just if you want to do all the things that a body does you need a small town maybe of machines to do everything that all the parts of body do and uh, still you cannot be that efficient that the body is but I'm talking not about body only I'm talking about the soul which compared to the body is much 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 greater we see the body but unfortunately we don't look at the soul we know very little we have not been given from knowledge except very little yes they ask you from this you know they ask you about the spirit the spirit is from the command of my lord we don't know even human spirit let alone to know the holy spirit but alhamdulillah alhamdulillah because of lots of efforts of the prophets and messengers and scholars and mystics ethicists we have now a very valuable literature on a spirituality on ma'rifatun nafs on self-building alhamdulillah and it's up to us to familiarize ourselves with this in the book self-knowledge I have mentioned some hadith that I would like to mention two three of them only here there is a famous hadith that you can maybe find in every book on Ma'rafatun Nafs I don't think you find any book on Ma'rafatun Nafs without having this hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is quoted as saying Man arafa nafsah faqad arafa rabbah whoever knows himself knows his Lord or whoever has known himself has known his Lord there is a close connection between Ma'rafatun Nafs and Ma'rafatun Rabb. If you know yourself, you know your Lord. If you don't know your Lord, you don't know yourself. <laughs> the late Allah Matabatabai used to say there is a relation between this hadith and the ayah in Surah Al Hashr. La takunu kalladina nasullaha fa'ansahum anfusahum don't be like those who forgot God and God made them forget themselves if we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we forget ourselves if we remember and know ourselves we know him so there is no way to know yourself without knowing him to be mindful of yourself without being mindful of him Another beautiful hadith that we have is Amirul Mu'min salam saying Ma'rifatun nafs anfa'ul ma'arif Knowing yourself, self-knowledge is the most beneficial knowledge If you know yourself This is more important than knowing what's the I don't know price of dollar today or pound today or you know uh, you know different languages different skills they are all important I'm not underestimating them but I'm saying this is more important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put so much in every human being every human being every child of Adam potentially is great to the extent that Quran says لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored children of Adam and this is for all لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ and we enabled them to move in the land in the seas 
But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِمَّا خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا we have raised them over many of the things that we have created. So just by creation, we are already greater than many creatures. Not all, but many of creatures. And by exercise, by efforts, by a spiritual struggle, we can become better even than angels. So Ma'arifatun nafs is very important. So the first thing that we have to do after waking up, after getting rid of our heedlessness, is to know ourselves, what we can become. We can go to A'la Illiyin. We can reach the position that even angels cannot reach. And na'udhu billah, we can go to asfalu safilin, to the lowest of the low. We can be better than angels, we can be worse than animals. It's up to us. And then you start with self-care. You have to take care of yourself. Ya ayyuhal amanu alaykum anfusakum. لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ مَنْ ظَلَّ إِذَا احْتَدَيْتُمْ Or those who believe, you must be concerned about yourself. Take care of yourself. If you are guided, those who go astray would not harm you. If you protect yourself, ill people, ill-minded people cannot harm you. So, we have to look after ourselves. Of course, part of it is to have good understanding of how to relate with others, how to do our social, social responsibilities, but all in the spirit of self-care. I have to take care of my spirituality and my taqwa. Part of it, I do my social tasks, but I never do anything social, political, economical, while I have forgotten myself and my taqwa and my relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for self-care, then you have to acquire certain aqidah, you have to acquire certain values and virtues, and you have to be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have to do as remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certain actions. You have to establish prayer. You have to fast. You have to give alms. You have to avoid haram. Zikrullah in the kull halal and haram. We have to remember Allah when we are faced with halal and haram. Not just to say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. Just saying is good, but it's not enough. Remembering Allah when you are faced with a choice between halal and haram. That's the time that you must remember Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and this remembrance should continue. So you can say. Make sure that our actions comply with Allah's Sharia, having proper aqidah, having virtues and get rid of vices, but remembrance of Allah is something that has no limit and it continues forever. So this is what I wanted to say at the beginning, but because we are approaching time of Salat, so inshallah we continue in the next session. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete all the blessings that he has given us with the blessing of building ourselves in the way that he wants. We have already lots of potentials, lots of great gifts given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we don't become what he wants, they are wasted. And we would be blaming ourselves and we would be questioned for we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete all his blessings 
by giving us tawfiq to make ourselves what he wants from us to make ourselves the best version of ourselves to make ourselves true servants of him and true helpers of each other inshallah alhamdulillah rabbil alameen Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Ya'welcome. So inshallah, we'll now move to the question and answers. Um, there were many comments and questions that have come through. I'll try to keep it limited to the ones that are related to today's topic and to the course. Um, so we have a question here from Brother Muzammil. It says, Shaykh, the self-awareness coming to self-knowledge, as there are also psychological forces for resilience, and includes self-awareness. So is this also taught in the Qur'an and teachings of Ahlul Bayt? So does self-awareness come into self-knowledge? Yes. I, I think uh, self-awareness is a beginning of self-knowledge, but it continues. You know, some ulama say it's the first manzil, yeah. the first a station is yaqza. Uh, Imam Khomeini in his Jihad Akbar, he has a book which is based on the Akhlaq lectures he gave to you know, seminarians, Jihad Akbar, you know, a spiritual struggle. Uh, and he talks about Yaqza as the first step. Some people say it's the first step, some people say actually stations start after this, it's like a zero because this is the departure point uh, still you have not reached any station without having awakeness so for sure the first thing that ca that has to happen is to become awake to become alert but there is no way to think that this can uh, stop therefore it comes along with all uh, stations even if i am in the 10th for example or 20th or 30th uh, station I cannot go to sleep actually when you go further your alertness must increase imagine if you are climbing a mountain if you are on the ground your alertness is needed in order to take off but when you go higher you need more alertness the risks are more the dangers are more challenges are greater so self-awakeness continues all the way. Thank you. Very You're much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have another good question here um, from Sister Angela. It says, "Would the purest form of Islamic culture be in the most simple?" yet complex concept of application of Tawheed. So can you say Tawheed is the purest form? Yes. Yeah. Tawheed is the air in which we breathe. If we are really true Muslims, if we are true believers, for us, Tawheed is the air with which we breathe. And therefore, you can never <laughs> forget Tawheed. And you can never do anything that would contradict with Tawheed. Tawheed must be in every cell of us, in every drop of blood of us, Tawheed. Unfortunately, we sometimes say, La ilaha illallah. But we don't exhibit this with our thoughts, with our actions, with our planning, with our priorities, with our customs. Alhamdulillah, over history, m Muslims from different places of the world, and the same with Christians, Jews, other believers in God, in the Abrahamic family, or even before Abraham, there have always been people who did their best to make the idea of Tawheed concrete 
in certain forms of manifestations for example in paintings in architecture in calligraphy in s urban planning in many things there have been many cases alhamdulillah but to be honest this has not always been the case and many times we have failed to let tawhid be the deriving and the, the driving and the governing force we need to go back to tawhid and then bring more fragrance of tawhid and the fresh water of spring of tawhid to our life and make our lives flourish tawhid in your family life <coughs> tawhid in your business tawhid in your studies tawhid in the community tawhid in the i don't know traffic how we drive tawhid in consumption tawhid in the way we deal with the environment everything should be inspired by tawhid how you as a servant of allah who is the most perfect the most beautiful the most merciful how you are acting to help everything to remain in the connection that uh, they have with Allah and to make that connection better if there is something beautiful and I make it ugly or dirty I am working against Tawheed if there is a natural resource and resort and I damage it it's against Tawheed if there are two people and I bring division and suspicion among them, this is against Tawheed. Tawheed is very, very important and very far-reaching. And therefore, no matter how much we believe in Tawheed and how much we you know, respect Tawheed, I think there is a still great room and a space for improving our being monotheist.